Ross and Kitty be invited into places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to get into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performing. Right, uh, I hope lunch was uh, good. I'm French, so it wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. Um, so, uh, actually, uh, I'm going to be kind of a mix between the last two talks that you had, uh, because I'm French, just like Loic, and I work at Heroku, just like Jonan. Uh, so I do work at Heroku. We bought uh, Salesforce a few years ago, or maybe it's the other way around. We never exactly know. So who here dares to deploy their application on a Friday? Okay, <laughs> standard procedure, nice. <laughs> so I, I would just want to make things clear first because um, I know that uh, in Israel, you have your weekends on Friday and Saturday, so you do not deploy on Fridays because it's the weekend. So it does work also to uh, deploy on Thursdays. And uh, it's, um, sorry, I, f I forgot. My <laughs> so it's, it's actually uh, deploy any day of the week or like since we don't know, maybe we should just uh, like give it to, to fate, to random stuff. So just like there is the psychic goat for uh, political elections and it's never wrong, right? So maybe we should also uh, rely on that stuff which is absolutely right. Uh, whenever it it it's something, it's it's going to happen. Anyway, so uh, deploying on Fridays is actually seen usually as something uh, which is very frightening, uh, which people are afraid of, and that we don't do. Uh, I've even seen uh, Fun Day Friday, where people do other stuff than the usual stuff on the Friday, so that uh, they don't do a deployment on that day. It's not good, however, in my opinion, because it creates a silo where one day each five days, you're not going to be able to actual, actually perform proper work and deploy your application. So in this talk, we're going to see a few methods to improve our confidence and be better able to deploy any day of the week, just so we can be like this guy who deploys from anywhere, including the uh, Tel Aviv beach. Um, all right. Uh, computer science is actually fairly uh, a very new thing. Modern computer science is, uh, is under uh, a century old. So we are very young, we're very babies, very much babies. So the best thing to start with would be to start taking example from older sciences, much older sciences which have had a lot of history and which we can learn from. So there is one science we're going to rely on here, it's archaeology. What's, what's older than archaeology, with the studying of old things? And there is one very well-renowned scientist we're going to rely on as well. It's that guy. Uh, you may have heard of him. Uh, so how does Indiana Jones do to replace a production component? So take production running component and replace it with another one. Let's see just right now. Easy. Unfortunately, if you fast forward a few minutes in the movie, it's, it finishes like this. Which is not really what we want when we deploy our, our application. So what, what can we learn from that? Like there's mistakes being made, we can learn from them to improve, what can we learn? The first thing we can learn is uh, we need to make sure our sandbag has the right weight before removing the stone, or put in other words, we need to plan and test before doing something. So we're doing the planning. We're planning. And we're going to do it right now. And there it doesn't work, obviously. It wouldn't be funny otherwise. So the what we really want to be able to do and to be able to confidently deploy any day of the week and test uh, our things all the time is to be able to fix things as quickly as possible as soon as they arrive and they won't. Ah, so be able to fix things as quickly as possible as soon as they arrive so we can land the plane properly. 
There it goes. So if, if there is one thing that you should take out of this talk, it is that we need to be able to roll back our code as quickly as possible. And whenever we can do that, we're going to be f to feel a lot safer. It's going to be a lot safer to deploy your application on a Friday. If when there's an issue, you know that within a few seconds, you can actually roll back your code and be able to move to the next slide. All right, um, and be able to safely deploy from a bit. So let's take a real life example. The team I work on at Heroku is called Build. So we basically run the Git server and we run everything which allows anyone to deploy an application until the application is deployed. So when Jonan was deploying his bots uh, earlier, he was actually calling the component I'm going to talk about right now. When, whenever there is a build, we have a pool of instances. So this is one of those instances which will run a build. So we, we start uh, multiple instances, we have a pool of those, and it waits for a build. And when it gets one, it's going to process it, build the container, and create the release. Unfortunately, that was something which was doing way too many things. It was poorly tested, it had lots of undocumented feature. Pro tip, if you're dealing with bash, there's lots of things you don't know which are happening in your app. Uh, it was hard to maintain and it was very hard to evolve. So we wanted to change it. And there had been a few attempts at replacing that component. Unfortunately, most of them were just trying to do a send back replacement. We had a long running branch running for some time to replace the component. And at some point we were trying to uh, merge it and to just deploy it. That's obviously the way to failure. If if just the long running branch ever gets merged. And so we were basically doing this. So what we've done instead is that we've taken on, av on another science, biology, and we've performed cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is the process of cells dividing. And so that means that instead of having one big stuff that we replace with another one, we divide it uh, to conquer and we divided the thing into multiple steps which we deployed every time, all, all, all the process long. So we had this, this huge thing, this build instance, we were doing many things, and we started by extracting the procession of the build. So we introduced a new component, which was integrated with the first one, and the old component started removing codes, and the new one started just introducing code. And then pro regularly, progressively, we moved on to other stuff until finally we were uh, at a state where we were uh, happy enough. In our case, we wanted just the old component to do only the polling and waiting for a new build and have a component which would uh, just be a generic way of processing builds and wouldn't know about the Slack pool. That's progress, baby steps, pro pro progress through baby steps, doing multiple things all, all day long and deploying them all the time so that we carry a lot less risk and we can be more confident because every time we deploy something, it is much smaller than if we just waited until the end of our feature to actually make the deployment. Right, at this point, you might be thinking this dude is nice, but uh, what he's saying is complete uh, theory theory and uh, seeing baby steps is a thing, but actually doing it is something else. So let's take things in practice. Has anyone here heard of the Mikado method? Okay. So uh, the game Mikado, I guess everybody knows it. Uh, the game Mikado is that we're going to try to pick up that stick, the blue one here, uh, here without moving any other sticks. So there's two strategies to it. The first one is just uh, just pick the stick and lose because you don't you're not allowed to move any other stick. And the other strategy is to actually pick every stick at the at the top until we can go to the bottom and pick the last the last stick. The Mikado method is going to be the same thing for computer science. So let's say that we have a blog which our code, our blog code does only the rendering, HTML rendering. And we have an API behind that which gives us posts, a way to fetch posts, and a way to fetch users. 
we need to upgrade that API from v2 to v3. So running with long branches, we would be running that and doing the entire code upgrades in a branch, in a feature branch. And once the feature branch is stable, we would ship everything and it would probably break at some point, or at least something would break. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab a sheet of paper. So I know, I know it can be a bit difficult uh, for us to say uh, it's not happening on a laptop, it's happening uh, in, in paper. But we're going to grab a sheet of paper and a pen, and we're going to write our goal. So our goal here is upgrading our API version from v2 to v3. And we're going to try to do that in this most simple way that we can. So like we're going just to update the configuration, saying that the user agent that we send is v3 instead of v2. And we're going to try that, run our tests, and see how it goes. Obviously, it's going to fail, because if there wasn't any breaking change, there wouldn't be an API version upgrade. So we're going to write down every obvious reason why it fails. Not every, like every running test, we're not going to fix every unit test uh, independently. We're going to write obvious reasons why it failed. So for example, it's going to fail on upgrading fetching posts and upgrading fetching users. So we're going to write that down on our sheet of paper, and we're going to revert our code. Revert everything. We haven't done anything. Except now we have a sheet of paper, and we know that if we start implementing our stuff, it's going to fail at those points. And we're going to try implementing them. So we're going to try implementing imp imp uh, upgrading fetching, u in fetching posts to API v3, only the posts. And we're going to see what fails. And exactly as before, implementing it in the simplest way possible. And whenever something fails, we will uh, write down the obvious reason why it's going to fail. In our case, for fetching posts, in our API v2, it was using integer IDs. And our API v3 is requiring UUIDs. So we're going to upgrade our API to UUIDs while just, just doing the API upgrade to UUIDs. Hopefully, the version 2 also knows a bit about UUIDs, even if it's not the default. So we're just going to do the upgrade, just that. We're not upgrading our API version. We're just upgrading and f changing from integer IDs to UUIDs. And what that means is that it's going to be a much simpler, much smaller, and much more safer change than if we had done the entire upgrade at first, and at the same time, we had done the UUID upgrade because we need it. So we're going to do the uh, UUID upgrade alone, ship it, and release it. And we're going to write that down on our sheet of paper, write it as done. And then, since that is fixed, we can go back to the previous prerequisites that we had and which were failing, and we can try implementing them again. Except this time it's going to work because we've fixed everything which was preventing us from, uh, from going forward. And so we're going to just upgrade fetching posts alone, fix that stuff here, and it's going to work. And we can ship it and deploy it as well. And the same for fetching users, which we can ship and deploy. Finally, once we, you, you, I guess you've guessed it by now, once we have fixed every prerequisite, we can fix the actual goal. And we have actually upgraded, upgraded our API version. It maybe took us a bit longer than if we just had done our uh, quick and dirty uh, API upgrade in a feature branch. But it has been shipped in very small changes, all, all project long. And we haven't taken huge risks in upgrading our API version. The Mikado method can be awesome for team communication as well, because uh, it means that if we just upgrade our API version, we're going to be hardly able to work as a team on doing that, because we're just like saying, OK, I'm creating the API version and uh, do whatever you want to do at the same time, but don't touch my code. Except with the Mikado method, since we have a tree of things, explicit things to work on, we can build that tree as a team. So do a bit of mob programming and build the tree. And then every, uh, assign a branch to everyone. So we'll assign upgrading UUIDs to Alice. And we'll assign upgrading fetching users to Bob. And they will be able to work both on their own side of things without jumping and without uh, touching each other's parts. 
giving us uh, atomic, uh, ev even more atomic things to, to work on and uh, yeah. So there's a few rules to the Mikado method and there are actual rules, they're not guidelines. Uh, this image here is just funny, there's nothing else to it. Uh, so there are actual rules. The first one is that we do need to write everything down. Uh, if we don't, we'll end up like Nick, uh, just drinking and forgetting. And uh, yeah, if, if we don't write everything down, we'll just uh, end up like saying, oh, this is a very small thing and I'm not going to write a new branch to this. I'm just going to fix it at the same time. And then when doing the small thing, we're going to see another small thing and then it's going to end up as a long running branch, which we do not want. The second thing is that we absolutely need to revert every time we uh, add a new prerequisite. That can be hard. Uh, it can be easy to just say, oh, I'll create a new branch and I'll just do that and keep the work I've been doing for the past 15 minutes because my time is so valuable that uh, I can't lose those 15 minutes. Except that it, y when you're going to come back to it, you're going to have another point of view because you have fixed something else at the same time. And if you just go back and do go back to the same branch, uh, you are highly probably missing things. And furthermore, since you already fixed the, fi the thing once, it's anyway going to take a lot less time than, than it took the first time. And as you have a different approach, you're probably you might also find issues that you didn't see the first time. So do absolutely revert every time there is a new prerequisite. That's progress, baby steps progress. Uh, we have a method to actually be able to do that progress and not just rely on saying we're doing baby steps, like we're actually following that stuff so that we can have very small uh, deployments. As a side note, when you hear about companies, uh, like Amazon says they deploy their application once every 11 seconds, uh, they, when companies say they deploy 50 times a day, it is not a new feature 50 times a day, obviously, uh, but it is much more like this kind of deployments, very small deployments, which change like many ju maybe just uh, a new method or just a very small thing just to uh, reduce the risk. But there will always be risk. We can plan as we want. We can mitigate risk as we want. There will always be some risk. So there's other things, other methods that we can use. Uh, the first one is uh, canary deploys. So uh, canaries were used in coal mines uh, before robots uh, to prevent, like, if carbon monoxide was released in the mine, the canary would die first, and then we could prevent workers from dying just by killing a bird. I just hope no one here is a member of the Animal Protection Association. So we will have an architecture like this, where we send a request to router, so that can be HA proxy or an ELB or anything. We'll send the request to a router, and that request will then be sent either to server A or server B. So we'll have 50% of our traffic going to one server and 50% to going to another one. What it means is that we can deploy our change that we've considered as risky to only one server, let's say server B. And that means that all our code, new code, risky code, is going to be only deployed to half of the requests and the other half is going to keep working properly. And if that doesn't work, we can just roll back. For the customer side, if that doesn't work, we can just reload the page. Of course, we can add more servers, which gives us more granularity. In this case, here we have 66% of the traffic to the old version and 33% to the new one. Canary deploys are even more awesome for non-HTTP stuff. So uh, this is an example with a sidekick that uh, you, I hope everybody, everybody knows of. It's, so it's a background worker for Ruby. Uh, the idea here is that in purple, we have the main worker running, and in blue, we have a canary. So whenever a job is triggered, it's going to go either to the main worker or to the canary. It's even more awesome than with HTTP requests because they can be retried. So if our canary fails, we're going to retry it and it's going to have the same percentage of chances of going back to the main worker instead of the canary. 
So like if we are sending an email if our in our background job and in the new version that fails, it's going to retry and actually send the email just a few seconds later to the customer. Uh, so this is an open source project if you want to check it out. Canary deploys are going to be awesome for benchmarking and refactoring because, uh, so they make Obama happy, because uh, we have two versions of the same application running at the same time. So we can compare and get some data on, our both, on, of our, on both our versions and benchmark those. So this is an example uh, from a service running at Twitter where they upgraded Go, Go from version 1.6 to 1.7. And we can see this is the GC pose, so the lower the better. And we can see uh, a clear improvement uh, in the canary running Go 1.7, which means that the experiment was successful. It's however not going to make Obama happy for customer facing changes, because if you're trying to upgrade a new design, and uh, whenever we load a page or reload it, the, your customers don't get the same design, that's definitely not going to be a good user experience. Canary deploys are not perfect either. Nothing is perfect. They have their use, uh, but they're not perfect. They have a few issues. The first one is that uh, it's difficult to have a lot of granularity with them. Uh, I don't know for you, but it's a bit rare to have 100 services, 100 servers or more of the same instance running, if even more with microservices, uh, where uh, you end up having a lot of small things running in two or one instances. So uh, actually doing 99 into 1% is going to be very difficult. The second is that uh, rolling back is just going to be the same thing as we do. It is going to be that we either shut down the server running the canary or that we need to do a new deployment, restart the process and everything, which takes time. Finally, um, yeah, finally, uh, a canary deploy can be seen as a scientific experiment and the basis of scientific experiments is that we shouldn't perform several experiments on the same data sample, otherwise we lose every meaning uh, on, the, on that experiment. So if we, if that means we cannot uh, multitask because we cannot perform several canary experiments at the same time, upgrading of our version of Rails and Ruby at the same time. And that's, that's a pain for working as a team. So what we're going to see now is gradual rollouts, which will allow us to fix some of those issues, which are not perfect either. Canary deploys are still useful. Uh, which will allow us to uh, fix some of those issues. So a gradual rollout will work basically like this. We'll have a request going into one server and inside our code is going to decide whether we send it to the old code path or to the new code path. So we're going to decide that 99% of the requests are going to the old code path and 1% is going to the new code path. We're going to decide that fairly easily. So in our condition, we just decide whether we're in the partial rollouts based on the user ID and send uh, to the old or the new code path. And we decide that by doing the user ID modulus 100 and checking that on the value, which is static here, the one, but you probably want it to be dynamic. What is going to allow us to do is that we're going to be able to roll back without having to do any deployment. If our new version is not working properly as we expected, we are just going to have to put the percentage at 0% and every go everything is going back to the old method and we do not need to deploy again. It's also going to be to allow us to perform uh, gradual rollouts as per their name. Uh, so what we usually do at Heroku is that we will deploy the change at 0%, usually at the beginning of the week. And we'll keep it like that uh, at 1% for a day. And then unless something bad happens, we'll put it at 20% a day after, then 40% a day after, and 60%. Then if we've deployed the change on a Monday, we're now on Thursday. And on a Friday, we'll put it at 100% and leave it like that for the weekend. And then on the following Monday, we'll be able to remove the old codes and we've done our risky deployment properly. 
So gradual rollouts are going to be awesome also for refactoring and benchmarking, just like uh, canary deploys, and for the same reason, because since we have both our versions running at the same time, we can compare data. They are going to be relatively awesome for customer-facing changes, since based on our uh, the code that we had earlier, one user is always going to have the same user ID, so they're always, if they're flagged into the gradual rollouts, they're always going to be flagged into it. They are, gradual rollouts are not a good way to perform long-running uh, experiments uh, with customer-facing changes. If you do need to do that, you may want to investigate feature flags instead, but they are not the subject of this talk. So, um, through these things, through the Mikado method, where we can uh, reduce the impact of our changes to atomic changes and reduce their risk as much as possible, through canary deploys and gradual rollouts, where we can reduce the risk of actual deployments, because t even with the Mikado methods, uh, deployments will actually always carry risk and they have to be uh, like you, you wouldn't need to do a canary or a gradual rollout every time but depending on the risk that you assess for that change you will probably want sometimes to be extra care that nothing breaks with all those things we can increase vastly our confidence in our deployments and be able to maybe not just tomorrow but like uh, after we've been able to implement, fully implement, and maybe change them a bit depending on how our needs, those methods, we can gain in confidence and actually be able to work and deploy any day of the week and whenever that is needed. Obviously, we've just scratched the surface here, so you may want to go further. Uh, I know I learn a lot by reading, so I'm going to recommend a few books. First one is uh, uh, the book on the Mikado methods. So it's Manning, Manning Editions. It's the only one on the subject. So if you search on a search engine Mikado method book, uh, you're going to find it easily. Uh, the release it book, uh, though I personally find it to start getting a bit old on a few bits, but it's still um, re really a reference on the broader subject of releasing code with stability in mind. And finally, the Google SRE book, uh, written by a, a team of people at Google, is really, really uh, a reference, uh, the best in my opinion, to get an overview of good practices to ship stable software. Uh, and the best of all, so those slides, uh, if you want to get them, uh, they are right here. Thank you very much. Once again, my name is Damien. Uh, I work at Heroku, uh, which is which is very nice of being my travel and hotel. We do have some swag left for some who want. And uh, I don't think there's questions. Uh, well, I don't know if we have time or not. Okay. So uh, there is my Twitter and GitHub handle here if you want to reach out to me. And thank you very much. <laughs>